All right, we've shifted out of screen share. It's good to be here with you all today. Uh, my name is Sandra Beasley. We've got a panel today in celebration of dialogue with our elders and particularly our grandmothers. I've got two uh, incredible poets who I'm excited to share the space with. Um, just to give a little bit of an overview, I'm going to uh, introduce folks and uh, I'll, I'll read first. We'll then hear from Saida Agostini and Terry Ellen Cross Davis. And then we'll break out of our brief readings into a kind of more communal conversation. Um, I just wanna mention first that the impetus for this panel existing is incredibly organic. I mean, I, I hope Terry doesn't mind me saying it's like one of those sidewalk conversations where you're ending one thing and route to the next thing and you say, what have you been up to with writing? And you just confess, this is something I've really been thinking about. Uh, and in this case, what I had been thinking about was running uh, not once, not twice, but three times across students who wanted to share something about their grandparents, in particular their grandmothers, and then in preface to sharing the poem, the essay, the short story, said, oh, I was told I, I really shouldn't write about this. This would be sentimental. This would be like uh, familiar, you know, cliche. And uh, well, I'm going to code my language. Uh, no, like, don't do that. Darn that. Darn that. Uh, you know, and, and I think that what we had was a moment of realizing how important it is to write through our inheritances, to write through our cultural legacies. And that means naming and claiming the people who came before us in our families. Um, so uh, we've got the three of us today. Again, my name is Sandra Beasley. I'll do a very brief bio and start the reading, mainly just because I wanna be the, the icebreaker. And then we'll, we'll move to Saida. I'll, share her bio in that moment before she reads and then we'll do terry and i'll share her bio before she reads and then we'll come together um i'm going to keep my bio short because i i'm fortunate enough to be in multiple 1455 events for this festival i'm the author of four collections of poetry i live in washington dc specifically southwest dc i grew up in northern virginia and I'll only mention this in this panel, I had one grandmother in uh, Tyson's Corner and one grandmother in McLean. And I say grandmother because uh, in both cases, my, my grandmothers outlived my grandfathers by a significant number of years. Um, maybe that'll be something that comes up during the Q&A, uh, you know, that, that what happens in particular when one uh, is with us longer than the other. Um, I'm going to read three poems that all appear in my collection, Made to Explode, which uh, came out in oh, gosh, April <laughs> this year, the strange pandemic year. And I will start with a poem that is called Winter Garden Photograph. And strangely enough, I wrote this poem in Ireland. And I want to mention that because I think Ireland as a, a place, I was there for a semester in residence teaching and writing. It is a place that pays a lot of attention to its grandmothers. And so it kind of helped me that I felt like I was in dialogue with others that, uh, that were, were making comments in that direction. Um, there's an epigraph here called After Roland Barthes. And I would just mention that I was rereading Roland Barthes' Camera Lucida, which is very much about how memory and family is encoded in photographs specifically. Winter Garden Photograph After Roland Barthes. Barthes withholds this image from camera Lucida. Henriette, the five year old who grows up to be his mother, her hands on her hips. He couldn't bear that our gaze might find her ordinary, as one might find this snapshot of my grandparents arriving in Rapid City, South Dakota. Her precise handwriting on the back declares their America the Beautiful tour. Grandma Jean's jaunty scarf, Carl in his crisp white shirt, 1990. In 1991, I pick up the calendar she kept by her reading chair. Her neat script fills the square of January 22nd. Carl 
died, life is over. The woman in green jacket and green skirt, full throttle, smiles toward the camera as she rounds the corner of the terminal purse under one arm and blue carry-on under the other. Because this photograph is not mine to keep, I take a photograph of it. Bartz would say, I am now operator and referent, sliver of thumb and palm visibly cradling Kodak print. The rest of January 1991 stays blank. February blank, March bare. But then a church meeting is scheduled. She pencils in a lunch. Yes, she will come to the recital. Her cursive wakens the days. Even in winter, the garden can call itself to bloom. So that, that poem is largely about watching my, my grandmother experience her, her widowhood, which unfortunately you know, informs much of my childhood memories of her. Uh, this next poem is about uh, a legacy only realized in hindsight about one of those absolutely quotidian practical gifts that a grandmother might give a, a granddaughter. It's called Card Table. A practical gift for moving to the city. Good cherry squared around black vinyl, four long legs that fold within itself as a greyhound does, disappearing into a nap. Just big enough for a bridge match if I'd ever had four people willing to kiss knees, just big enough to let me call a corner of that S Street studio my breakfast nook stacked with a week's worth of newspapers while I ate cereal cross-legged on my futon, just big enough to pull out every few years and complain how small the table was, too crowded as a desk, too low for my chairs. In January, we stared at the strange space wedged between two kitchen doorways, might as well try the card table. We stacked onions there, then potatoes, then tomatoes and peaches, and it became the chopping table, stirring table, serving table. Now, the first morning she is gone, I see a swipe in the vinyl where a hot dish burned through and realize I forgot to ask for anything. A ring, her sheet music. So what I have is this reminder that she too was once a girl in a city and that she knew I'd always need a table. And I'll just read one more poem. Uh, it's got the title, Weak Ocean. I, I don't ever read this poem. This poem is touching on that delicate time where my grandmother was still in her house. Uh, and I'm totally complaining speaker and poet here, which again, I don't usually do, but I'm gonna do it here. Um, I, I think what is so hard is we often reach moments where our grandparents can no longer be in their houses uh, and we move them to protect them, but unfortunately that hastens a kind of decline. Uh, this, this, this attends to a check-in moment, um, particularly where I had been out of town and DC had an earthquake, uh, which for some of us will be <laughs> very, very resonant. Weak ocean. The quake was born in mineral Virginia and traveled north with a magnitude of 5.8. Cracks appeared in the Washington Monument. The cathedral lost two pinnacles. To explain the damage, seismologists will announce that we sit on only the thinnest layer of silts, weak ocean sediments. And beneath that, crystalline rock, whose shaking energy creates an echo chamber of the soft mud. I drive to her house. 90 miles north of Mineral and Park, where she used to grow snapdragons. I wait on the porch where geranium stood sentry, nodding their incomplete heads. We walk the house together, straightening paintings. My job is to move dish towels from the stove's burner and check for mold in the fridge. She worries about getting things in order for the girls. No one knows who 
the girls are. What about the china, her crystal flutes? The dining room is dusty, samovar hunkering in a corner. We peer through the cabinet's leaded panes at teacups and gilded saucers, champagne coupes. Only when I open the door do they give in to gravity. Stacks of porcelain that sag and swing, fractures, vertebral, grass, glass popping. She laughs, a kindness or symptom. Someone always lets the earthquake out. Okay, thank you. I want to move from there onto the work of Saida Agostini. Uh, amazing, this is, I, I'm so excited because I got to hear her read at the Arts Club and was blown away. Um, she is the author of Stunt, which was published by Neon Hemlock in October, 2020, a chapbook that reimagines the life of Nellie Jackson, a black madam and FBI spy from Natchez, Mississippi. Uh, Stunt uh, will, I, may have already debuted as a choreo poem in uh, in summer 2021. Uh, her first full length collection, Let the Dead In, will be released by Alan Squire Publishing in spring 2022. A Cave Canem graduate fellow, Saida is a two-time Pushcart Prize nominee and Best of the Net finalist. Her work has received report, support from the Ruby Artist Grants and the Blue Mountain Center, amongst others. We welcome Saida. Thank you. Um, I'm so excited to be here. I'm obsessed with talking about grandmothers in general, um, mainly because, you know, not to brag, but I think my grandmothers are pretty amazing. Um, yeah. And so that is a brag, but I feel really good about it. So <laughs> um, for context, I think this is always helpful to know. My family is from Guyana, South America, not to be confused with Ghana and West Africa, another really amazing country. Um, and one of the kind of stories um, that I've always kind of heard relegate, um, share back was about my great great grandmother who I had the opportunity to um, be in her life until I was about 36 or 37. Um, and this, and one of the key things was definitely kind of the story um, of why she left Guyana and moved to London, which was because she was dating a man who she found out was cheating on her and actually got married to another woman. So I um, decided that the best thing to do was to write a poem imagining her writing um, to um, her, you know, adulterous boyfriend, Mr. Chin. So here we go. It's called Lillian Carter starts a letter to a former philandering lover, London, 1963. My dear Mr. Chin, it could be supposed any sensible woman would stay. A man cheats as quick as they breathe. Here, a big egg yellow gal with scant hair and thrall, lovesick, I was a machine for your punishment, forced. I see it now, sir. And yes, those nights we spent roving in bed, the Guyana dark calling and calling so sweet, the pastor, your chest, my thighs, the choir, two great fat bodies collided with the force of desire. If, push to confess, I loved it when you reared up in pleasure and screamed glory, glory. After a lifetime of angry, brutish men, I found you a sort of black paradise. Everything left behind save my son. I prepared a daily feast of hallelujahs to lay at your feet. I a panting forest as you ate. Hear me cry so lonesome and wild to this white man's God for a little plot of half pleasure. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. So um, yeah, I love that. Um, and also if you met great, great, if you met great granny, you could see her saying this. So that felt really good to me too. Um, I had the opportunity to go back to um, Guyana and um, my family is from, my grandmother's side of the family is from a small river village called Cabo Cabiri um, in the Pomeran, which I guess in the US we would call more of like, you know, the country right, but real country. Um, and so we have a family um, burial plot there. And um, I actually got to go with my grandmother before she passed away earlier this year. So that was really a blessing. Um, and this is actually the poem that is the title poem 
the title of the entire collection that's coming out with Alan Squire. Um, and so it's called Granny Speaks to the Dead, um, Kabakabiri, January 2018. The wind is sulk and salt, shaking bamboo arched into a green path prayer for our path. Granny leads the way, mummy besides her, walking to the cluster of nameless concrete graves that compose the only family history we know. Everything before 1913 is a fruitless game of imagination, made for nights at home after rum and black cake, Granny and her sisters arguing over who died first and how, Aunt Rosamond, baker of the sweetest cakes in adventure, lost to her own love of sugar, or Uncle Clive, a dainty black man with sooty skin softer than the river he walked into. Even Granny's history is a twist of ready evasion. A young girl, eldest of 13, who lived hungry, breathless, and beautiful. Until my grandfather found her on the waters of Demerara, took her home and said, you are mine. Maybe that's all this graveyard is a sea of young men and women ready to play in whatever part I'll make them. Granny is beside me on hands and knees, cleaning a baby's grave, talking to her of death, saying, my sweet girl, I'm here, keep me company in my dreams, nah? I've learned from her how to make your own story, just like the dead end. So, um, my grandmother passed away in uh, late March of this year, and it's been pretty shocking. I was, I think, I, you know, I think you tend to believe that. I think, especially when you have been raised around powerful women, um, that they're never going to die; they're immortal. And I wasn't able to write for a few months, and this is the first poem. Sorry. <laughs> This is the first poem I've written, um, and it's, it's about her. It's called um, A Brief Sermon on Resistance. In the mornings, I go to the pond and look across a world crowded with life. Everything here is lovely in the blush of coming light. Loons singing to the mountains, the rushed echo of my voice coming back to meet me. The blueberries I beg from unforgiving bramble, its tender flesh bright in my mouth. Nothing else. You can trust the water to carry every good thing. My granny was born on black water, her mother keying on a small boat, walking with new life. The sun bearing down a fierce gold blessing. That same river carried her body, my arms circled around her coffin, the wind singing us home. Believe me when I say, I know we are all dying. It will take less than a lifetime to forget that I was here grieving for Granny at the pond's edge for this long day. It is beautiful to believe that some things cannot be changed, that my will, good or evil, cannot shift this land. Pray God we remember the faith of stone, what it means to rebel in unknowing. Thank you. Ah, uh, my only regret is I know if we were all in the same room, we'd all be feeling the same chills simultaneously. We'll have to feel them in our own spaces. Thank you for sharing that. That was beautiful. Um, all right, uh, let's let's welcome uh, Terry Ellen Cross Davis uh, to, to also share three poems. And I'm so excited for the dialogue that is to come. Um, uh, just, all right, calm myself. All right, uh, this is an emotional topic. It's part of the reason why too many students have been warned away from it. Terry Ellen Cross Davis is the author of A More Perfect Union, 2019 winner of the journal Charles B. Wheeler Poetry Prize from Mad Creek Books in 2021. Uh, her debut collection, Haint, 
published by Give All Press in 2016, won the 2017 Ohioana Book Award for Poetry. She's a Cave Conum Fellow and a member of the Black Ladies Brunch Collective. She was awarded the Poetry Society of America's 2020 Robert H. Winner Memorial Award and is the recipient of grants from the Sustainable Arts Foundation and the Freya Project. She is the poetry coordinator for the Folgers Shakespeare Library in Washington, D.C., and she lives in Maryland with her husband, poet Hayes Davis, and their two children. Welcome, Terry. Uh -huh. Thank you, Sandra. And Saida, I just, if, I do wish we were like together because I would have hugged you and grabbed your hand and said, okay, I got you. Go ahead. Um, I'm so excited to, to be here and to talk about grandmothers. I had the privilege of having a great relationship with both of my grandmothers, my paternal and my maternal grandmother, and uh, a relationship with a paternal and maternal great grandmother on both sides. So, um, and I can't wait to get to because there there are so many similarities that already that I, I'm ready to talk about. Um, so this first poem involves. I'll be reading poems from my my book that came out this February, A More Perfect Union. And this first poem involves my grandmother and her sister, my great aunt, Lola May, uh, who was <laughs> just a character in her own right. Um, and there's just a little tiny bit of language, but not, not too much. So Lola visits the underworld. Lola did what Orpheus couldn't. She snatched her big sister straight from hell. Folks say the war changed Sis's man, but he wasn't no dummy before. He came from this shit, putting hands on women. The first time he hit Sis, Lola was little, maybe seven, maybe six. She balled up her tiny fist, punched him in the back, and called her brothers, sisters, sorry bastards for not backing her up. There was another time he hit, and another, until the day came he put Sis in the hospital. A metal plate in her head, stitches where the knife cut. For seven days, she was a shade of herself. When she finally walked out, Lola was right there next to Sis's man. Baby Sis Betty came for backup. Four of them in the car. Ride ain't never been quieter. Sis's man dropped them home on his way to work. His heel barely left the door sill when the sisters pulled suitcases out. The bus ride north was long. Once, twice, Sis said she thought about going back, but Lola told her, sis, don't look back. Don't ever look back. She never did. That fool Orpheus could learn something. Um, this next poem uh, came from, I used to call it a docu-poetics poem, but after a conversation I had last night, I realized it's, it does, it does, uh, involve a little DJing, a little sampling. So it's, you know, you can put it that way too, but it uses the parts of the preamble of the constitution um, with account, verbal accounts from my maternal grandmother, uh, Katie May. And this is called the account of Katie May from my grandmother, September 9th, 1926 to July 26, 2019. We, the people, three-fifths of a person, in order to form a more perfect union. When Anne started school, they closed it rather than have black kids go. It was closed for two years. Establish justice. I was working at this cafeteria. It was all white. The manager came in the back and said, don't send any food out. We didn't know what it was about. They wouldn't let us serve food. It was a sit-in. After he closed that cafeteria, closed it, period. I thought, why do people hate us so bad? So bad you won't give us a little food or don't want us to sit down or even close your cafeteria on account of we want to eat. Ensure domestic tranquility. We made our dolls from the flower sack, burlap, picture of a pretty blonde girl. We stuffed her with cotton. Provide for the common defense. The way my father told me, we had land in Georgia till the Klan ran us off it. Promote the general welfare. My brother died when he was 10 years old. He was real smart, but he got sick. You had to go miles and miles to get to a hospital. Thinking after I was growing up, 
If he had gone to a hospital, he would have lived and secured the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. I worked on the farm, picked cotton, as soon as I could get out there, as late as I could say, sunrise to sundown, and you wanna be out early before it gets so hot, cause the sun beaming down on you all day is more than an ocean. The farm we worked on was a half and half. Whatever you have, half of it goes to the men that own the farm. The next one to you, that was your payment. Do ordain and establish this constitution for the United States of America. And I'm going to read this last poem, uh, thank you, Jesus, because this is one where my paternal grandmother shows up, and she was the woman who was responsible for me uh, really getting established in our church in Cleveland, Ohio, in East Mount Zion. She would write the welcome for the church on Sundays, and I would deliver it, uh, and that was my first taste of public speaking, and we had a lot of conversation about that, and it was Oof, Saida, your tears are contagious um, because now I'm just like, oh yeah, there are a lot of good memories there. And I think ah, conversation we'll have after the poem. Thank you, Jesus. When the blue and red sirens pass you, when the school calls because your child beat the exam and not a classmate, when the smartphone drops but does not crack, the rush escaping your mouth betrays your upbringing. Thank you, Jesus a balm over the wound. When the mammogram finds only density, when the playground tumble results in a bruise, not a broken bone, like steam from a hot tea kettle, thank you, Jesus, and the pent up fear vents upward out. Maybe it's a hand over breast, supplication learned deeper than flesh, as if one could shush the soul, the fluttering heartbeat with three words. Maybe it's not so dire, an almost trip on the sidewalk, the accumulated sales total showing savings upon savings. Maybe it's as small as an empty seat on the Metro, or maybe, thank you, Jesus, becomes the refrain every time your husband pulls into the driveway, alive and whole, and no one has mistaken him for all the black scary things. You mutter it, helpless to stop yourself from the invocation of a grandmother who gave you your first Bible. You say it because your mother, even knowing your doubt as a vested commodity, still urges prayer. You learned early to cast the net. Thank you, Jesus. And it's a sweet needle that gathers the fraying thread, hemming security in steady stitches. From birth, you've heard this language. As an adult, you've seen religion used nakedly as ambition. Yet this sacrifice of praise still slips past your lips, this lyrical martyr of your dying faith. And so, and there we are. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. And I, I guess what I would do to, to start off would be to just ask, was there a particular tipping point where you gave yourself permission to create this character who is obviously reflective of a real person on the page? Was there a moment where you realize that this person was destined to come into your poetry craft? Um, or was it always organically someone you invoked freely? I'm just kind of curious uh, whether there was a, a moment, like me, I mean, I had to really consciously kind of uh, reteach myself because I was like, no, no, I don't need to write about deep family. Like that was a kind of thing that I had in my head is like, oh, that means I'm, I'm running low on material, you know? And then I just thought, no, I'm writing about food and I'm writing about history, how can I not uh, go into my own, my own inheritances in that sense? I, I'm just curious if either one of you had a kind of epiphany moment where they spoke to you in a way that went onto the page or you had to kind of uh, give yourself permission for that material. I think a few things happened. I mean, I was, so I was actually, um, you know, really fortunate to um, go to the watering hole one year and Frank um, X Walker is it? Oh, yeah. yeah. So so Frank was there, um, and I had an opportunity to like do like a one on one session with him, and I was telling him, you know, the stories of my grandmothers, right? And he was just looking at me like, "Why the hell have you written about this?" And I was like, "That's a good question." <laughs> <laughs> 
that's fair. That's fair. Right. And I, I think for me, you know, what happened is, is that, you know, we are kind of taught that like writing about our grandmothers isn't real craft. It isn't real art, right? Like it's, it's saccharine, it's um, sentimental. It's like a Hallmark card, right? And for me, what I kind of started to have to do, and there's like a wonderful tradition of like so many black writers, I think in particular, who like have written about the history of their grandmothers, I kind of had to go back to them, right? I had to go back to folks who are writing about family. Um, and I think the other big piece that was really important for me was one, seeing that my history was history. Right. It wasn't just a story. It's actually history and it's valuable and necessary. And I think the other piece was was um, giving myself permission to write about things that I've been taught were family secrets mm -hmm. um, and that I owned it just as much as anyone else in my family. So for you, Saida, it was about permission and same with you, Sandra. You felt like you had to give yourself permission? A little bit. Yeah. 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 I, um, I'm. I thank goodness, I'm, I'm really thankful that I had the, the idea and the inspiration to start recording my grandmother. Um, once she hit 90, I was just like, wait a minute, this is a lot of history in one body. And this is a black woman who lived and was born and raised in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and then moved to Cleveland, Ohio, and lived through so much um, from 1929 to, you know. And so I thought, I better start recording this. And, and I began to record her. And as I recorded her histories and her stories, they were so rich. And my grandmother, my, my maternal grandmother was really taciturn. Ma, and we called her Ma. Um, because my mother called her Ma, so then we called her Ma. Um, she didn't talk a lot, but you had to kind of push her, and then she would begin to open up, and the minute her sister would come over, oh, it was over, um, because it was just laughing and, and, and chit-chatting for hours, um, and she was one of 13 children, so because I recorded her, and all that history was right there at the surface, the poet in me was like, that's fertile ground. How can you not pull from that? And I, I began to craft this narrative in my head about what role or just what opportunities she had versus the opportunities I had. Mm -hmm. And that distance of generations began to speak to me and give me, in that way, I felt I had permission because it was history. Like Saida was saying, it was history. And it was a history that I felt was overlooked. So much of mothering is invisible labor that we are taught not to acknowledge it. And I, I had to acknowledge it. And because I was coming into my blossoming as a mother, it was all of a sudden set in stark relief what she had to go through. Um, and and it, so it just made me more appreciative of her presence in my life. And the only thing, you know, I would kick myself about is just not having recorded my paternal grandmother, who I was extremely close to. I mean, I spent weekends with my grandparents, um, especially on the weekends where my grandmother would write that the morning welcome. And I would go over and, and spend the night beforehand. And it was a big to do because they would take me out to breakfast. Granddad would tie the bow on my church dress. And grandma would have me stand up in the living room and go over that speech time and time again and work on my elocution to work on everything. And because she came from Bessemer, Alabama, she had an accent at one point, but be, be, when she got to Cleveland, she would read all these Reader's Digest to lose her accent. And so you couldn't really hear my grandmother's Alabama accent. And so she was very conscientious of me not having, you know, too much of an accent, even though I was in Cleveland, you know, but still there's the Midwest twang and, and, and making sure that I spoke properly, um, and which in many ways began to influence me about cold switching. But I had that close relationship with her too. And I've, I've, and she's the one who shows up and thank you, Jesus, because indeed she gave me my first Bible. Um, and so I just, I, I, I just knew because I've been writing about motherhood, I felt like the gate was wide open to go to grandmothers and just to mind the richness of what they've seen, their experiences and their knowledge. I feel like knowledge of grandmothers could fill so many encyclopedias and it would be worthwhile reading. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I, I really appreciate what both of you said. I, first, the mention of just kind of authenticating 
a grandmother's role in history. Uh, both my grandmothers were married to men who were deemed historically significant. One, because he was a physician for some of the early Mercury flights, working with the astronauts, and the other because he uh, helped supervise civilian defense during the atomic testings in Los Alamos. So yeah, you're, I mean, at, like I, there was plenty of document, like I could do public searches for my grandfather's names and find them, but I couldn't find my grandmother's names anywhere. And that's that, so that really resonates. And also just Terry, that idea of recordings, I've got a stack of totally unlabeled tapes and 99% of them are blank. But I know that in one of them, there's 10 minutes of my grandmother singing Broadway tunes that she used to do to help me with my voice lessons in like middle or early high school. And I don't know which tape it's on. And I don't know where it is on the tape. And I can't bear to get rid of any of them mm. just for the off chance of getting rid of that one <laughs> recording of my grandmother's voice. Mm. Totally casual. <laughs> I was going to say, you know, that sounds like a poem. Oh. I know. <laughs> <laughs> That's what will come out of this panel is more poems. <laughs> I wonder if um I wonder if we can can speak a little bit to uh you know and we're we're starting to bump up against this. Is there an element of research in writing these poems? Is there an element of double checking with other family members of how something might have played out? Is there a moment of like you know checking places or dates or anything like that? I'm just curious because. E we can trust memory up to a point, <laughs> but then memory often starts to contradict itself. So I'm just curious if for any of you, as, as you, as you followed a figure, you, you kind of had to refresh your knowledge of a context, a historical context. Yeah. I mean, oh, sorry, Tara, go ahead. No, no, no go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. So I was fortunate enough to get a grant. Um, you know, so I went back to Guyana for a month and I went back, um, with my maternal grandmother who just recently passed away, but I also did research in advance with my paternal grandmother as well, who um, like you, Terry, that was like, she's the one I'm like super, super close to, right? Um, and it was fascinating because, oh, it's weird. As much as my family talks, like they leave out a whole lot of details, you know? So like, you know, my grandmother was like, oh yeah, I was the last of 13 kids. I met your grand, my first date with your grandfather was like, at an Italian restaurant in Guyana. Like, so all of these details, like I didn't learn until I sat down and like literally put a, pointed a camera, camera at my grandmother and was like, just tell me these stories, right? Um, I would say for my maternal grandmother, it was really interesting because she didn't want to be recorded. So a lot of the work was more about just kind of like sitting in the kitchen um and you know literally just listening to her right um and then going back and doing that work of trying to fact check the hard part about this though um that i think pops up for a lot of black folks is that that ability to fact check um is incredibly constrained by like ongoing like the ongoing impacts of historical racism and systemic oppression. You know, I went to the National Archives in Guyana to look up our family history and try to figure out, you know, what what boat did we come, were we forced on, you know, from, you know, from Africa, right? Like, and it doesn't exist, um, you know, whereas they had like, you know, the names of indentured servants from India and China. Um, you know, when I asked why, it was like, well, you were seen as property, right? And so it's been really interesting also kind of to have this juxtaposition of like so much of my, I'm, I'm a black woman and so much of my own black history, I cannot chart, but my grandmother um, is Chinese and Arawak. And so there's a bit more that I can trace back, right? Um, because there wasn't this sense like, oh, you were property. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been hard. And it literally sometimes feels like an erasure poem for me. I, I had the same experience trying to to get more information about our ancestral history, and and and, and I think also part of these grandmother poems um, are an outcropping of after I had my two children, I immediately became interested in my ancestry because 
here you have two examples of them walking around. These are my genes at play. Um, and, and then it was the other part of it, like I needed to know where my family was in case my children ever showed up in that state. They at least knew someone who could give them a home cooked meal and a bed if necessary. Um, so just creating that safety net around my children. And as I would go to the National Archives here in DC, I had to begin to check tax rolls and property rolls for my family because again, property and you know and it was hard to find them and it's 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 difficult when you're looking for your family um, amid you know cows and pigs and you're like these were people um and for me the fact checking came with my mother and which in many ways I don't know if she's watching but like it's like talking with her kind of gave me tacit permission to continue right because she saw these poems and she knows these poems and um, she knows the stories I'm telling. In some parts of it, I had to omit things because it didn't serve the poem. Like, you know, and so there are those moments too where I'm like, okay, well, what's the really, the focus of the poem is these two sisters, you know, between Lola May and, and Katie May and Lola Visits the Underground or the focus of the poem is the account of Katie May. Um, and so it does, it, it, sometimes it feels like shaky ground, like a little bit like quicksand, because there's also that thing in the black community of not putting your business in the street. Mm -hmm. And so you're like, but at the same time, our business is history. And maybe this is a way to counteract those erasures, right? That are happening in, in archival senses and in, in, in other places and in other historical places, maybe putting our business in the street is the right thing to do so that we can begin to have business that other people can research years later. Um, and, and we can then be the history. Uh, and so that that's that's how I, I move forward with it. I, I there's still there's still a lot that's heavy on my heart and on my head to write about my paternal grandmother because, like you, Sandra, her I could look up my grandfather. He was the 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 city treasurer for Cleveland, and you know it's a whole story. His whole story made Jet Magazine. How he got his job, you know, like like and I and so it's like there are ways I can look him up. And she had to be the prop kind of on his arm, you know, to go to all these fancy events all around the world and, and you know, be this very elegant. She was five foot 10 and very slim, very, very slim. And, and you know, this very elegant woman um, and, and how to present herself. So I, I feel like those are stories that still need to be mined. I feel like I have a permission to move forward but I also have a poetic sensibility to that will allow me to create stories that are factually based, that give you a sense of who these women were. Great. Um, thank you. I, I want to ask a question and then I'm, I'm going to leave with my answer. And the reason why is that I want to give both Saida and Terry a chance to formulate answers <laughs> because it's going to have to do with recommending people to read. And I know that's a that's a question that uh, writers kind of dread <laughs> Q and A's because you're like, why didn't I prepare something beforehand? But I'm just thinking about other authors we maybe have read, uh, primarily in poetry, but really any genre where the grandmother or the grandparent figure struck you as complex, illuminating. Um, I'm gonna be selfish and mention Thomas and Beulah. I'm sorry, like just because I, I mean, I, you know, for me uh, when I I, I had gotten the chance to study with with Rita Dove, and then when I read that book, what I was what I loved was that it showed a marriage in all of its frustrations and disconnects and complications. And I think that one of the things that happens very quickly when you get beyond the immediate generation of a marriage is if it was long lasting, you want to paint it as therefore happy in that entirety mm. of that. And I felt really kind of um, freed that in Thomas and Beulah, there was, there was loss at the outset, there was trauma at the outset, there were things that these people were wrestling through individually while also bringing together at times a, a household that, that touched. Um, so that, that was really interesting to me as a way of illuminating thinking about a grandmother figure, what they held. Um, the other author who I'll mention, and then I'll check in with you all to see if you have any recommendations. The other figure I'll mention is uh, Richard Blanco, because uh, his abuela 
who appears, if we assume Speaker is poet, who appears in some poems, but also significantly in his memoir, is a, is a really interesting figure because she's strong, she's outspoken, she in some ways loves him and nourishes him and protects him, but in other ways she critiques the, her grandson uh, based on body type, based on sexuality, based on the choices he's making. And that I think is also really important to acknowledge in a space like this, that grandmothers, man, when they wield that scalpel, <laughs> it can be, uh, you know, it can be, it can be tough. And so um, I, I think we have, we can celebrate their kindness and also acknowledge the fact that sometimes they are, they are discerning in a way that it feels less than kind. Mm. Um, so I'm just thinking about the, the amazing ways that other writers and that, so that's, I'll start with Rita Dove and Richard Blanco as, as two writers, but are there, are there other people who come to mind as having wrangled with it in their literature? Yeah, I feel like we've talked about some, Saida. We did. I, and, and I'm just trying to remember who. Um, but I will say off the top of my head, like Toni Morrison, um, to flip the fiction, you know, Song of Solomon is one of those books that I always go back to whenever I need a centering and a grounding because so much of what she writes about reminds me of like what I've heard from my grandmothers, like the life of a certain time in America. Um, and maybe a time when there was more um, before integration, which is a whole thing that I've, I would talk to my great aunt a long time about. Um, and Damaris Hill, I, I just did a talk with her and um, she has a new book coming out called Breath Better Spent. And uh, she talks a lot about her grandmother and her relationship with her grandmother. Um, or, and, and again, you know, merging poet and, and narrative, but like, it, that and and I think it also something I feel like comes to comes to the forefront and a bound woman is a dangerous thing too in in her current collection. But I know that there are others. I want to say like Larry Van Cleef Stefan. I feel like yeah. I feel like Larry is like yeah yeah yeah. I feel like there have been other poets too who who have touched on grandmothers to the point of why I keep thinking there needs to be a, a, a compiled thing <laughs> of grandma. Uh, yeah, I can't name like a specific collection, but Lucille Clifton. Oh know, God, yes. Come to mind, you know, Toy Derricott. I mean, Toy Derricott really is like kind of like the possibility model for how to write about anything that feels deeply vulnerable. And <laughs> so it's like, I got you, hold on. <laughs> You know, um, and then I would say in terms of fiction, actually, so I would actually say both Free Food for Millionaires, as well as Pachinko by Min Jin Lee. Um, the women, like the, the, the matrilineal line um, that Min Jin Lee writes about in her books are so vivid and real. And like, for me, like, I feel like a deep sense of connection. I think, um, obviously, you know, um, as you talk about, um, you know, Min Jin Lee writes a lot about um, folks immigrating um, and, you know, managing kind of like the impacts of assimilation and what does it mean to kind of mother and parent um, when you live in the United States, but your, your own home is not here. And I feel like a deep sense of connection with that and can connect that a lot with um, the mothers in my own life. Um, yeah, so all those people, they're amazing. Let me check in. We we have a we have a little bit of time, but not a lot of time. Let me check in. Are there questions that either one of you have in mind that you wish would be asked or that you want to ask? I mean, I'm kind of curious to know, like, what is the poem that you want to write about your grandmothers that you haven't written yet? Mm. I think I think there's so much to explore in my paternal grandmother's life. And that's the thing that is holding heavy on my head because there are family members I can reach out to to get more stories. And it, that's just a thing that I have to do on that list of things to do. Um, and I think I'm afraid in so many ways to do so because it's to acknowledge a vulnerability of love to those people and I'm afraid of them passing. And so I'm, I think I'm just psychically trying to distance myself because I've experienced so much death in the last year and a half. Um, but I think there, there are stories um, from my, my paternal grandmother that are really interesting to me because she was an OBGYN nurse and uh, she was there to help deliver me. Uh, I came very quickly, second child. Uh, and 
she was there in the, you know, walking, going down the hallway while my mother was in labor because the doctor was running late. And there was the thought that my grandmother would actually end up delivering me. And um, she was there the one time I got put into a straitjacket uh, when I had to get stitches over my eye. Um, and I remember her holding my head and looking down at me and just trying to calm me down. And I mean, so there, there I, I want to dive into Virgie's life to have been the same height as her husband and then to grow another five inches after marriage. It's a, yeah, I know, I know, it's hilarious. And just her journey, the trajectory um, to be this girl from Bessemer, Alabama and to make it to Cleveland through New York, I think it's just a story that hasn't, I haven't, I just need to know more about her and, and her strength because like you, it seems all of our grandmothers she survived her husband, uh, mm-hmm. just like my maternal grandmother survived her first husband and her um, kind of partners afterward. Uh, and when she did and when she passed, I was on maternity leave with my son and I spent the, those moments of grief cradling him as a way to deal with my grief. Um, and consequently, he's a hugger uh, because that's what he grew up doing. So yeah, that would be me. When I visited my grandmother towards the very end of her life and she was in, I, I don't remember call if it was hospital care, but it was something, it was, you know, it was, it was medicalized care. And um, I was wearing this somewhat fancy looking coat that I bought secondhand in DC. And for some reason it, it kind of threw her, she loved the coat, but she, it threw her back to a, a memory uh, and it was young in her life. She grew up in small town, Texas. And her very first and probably one of her only jobs was at a department store. She was a she was an undercover <laughs> department store uh, employee. And her job was to watch for shoplifters, and which is kind of a strange job. You know, it is what it is. Small town, Texas. She was deployed in this or employed in this department store. And it was December and she was really proud because she watched this woman uh, like shop, like shoplift, sticky finger, thing after thing after thing. And she, and she quote unquote busted her. And, and she had this moment where she was like, I did my job, this is great. And there's this, there was a, a reckoning where the woman was brought in and they spread out everything that she shoplifted on the counter. And my grandmother looked at it and said, these were her Christmas gifts. This was everything she had tried to pick up. And she was devastated and she didn't know what to do. And this is just a story that I walked in in a nice looking coat that I'd paid secondhand money for. And she was, and it just came pouring out of her from however many, 60 years earlier. And I've never... I don't know what to do with that, but that's the moment you asked that question, Saida, that was the thing that came to mind, that, that memory, that story. Yeah. Is it, do you have one? Do you have a thing? Yeah, I guess like, so um, on my paternal side, my grandfather's mother, so my great, great grandmother, um, you know, she was a very beautiful woman. Um, the rumor is just that she danced with the Prince of Wales when he came to Guyana. Um, and she also was really good for like cursing people out, um, in a very, very like classy way. And there's this one particular story of a woman who was going after her husband. Um, and she, you know, was like, not under the heavens, would he ever look at you? Um, and so I'm just, I really want to write about that. So I, I think that's like kind of one of the ones that are coming. I'm just very fascinated by all of the women in my family and the fact that they just seem to not give a care ever. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> if, there's, if there's anything we ought to be able to learn from our, <laughs> from our grandmothers, it's that. Mm-hmm. Um, we're, we're, just, we're just at the closing mark. So I, I don't want to be mindful of people's time, but is there anything else that you want to say or mention or put out there. I just want to encourage folks to uh, to buy Terry's most recent book, A Perfect, A More Perfect Union, to buy Saida's book. So will it be out, uh, Saida? And is the is the scheduling still in place? Um, actually, I just got an email this morning. So pre-orders will be available via Alan Squire on Monday. Um, and the title is, again? The title is Let the Dead In. Excellent. Excellent. 
Um, and yes, and I'm realizing, Terry, I, I, I said my pub date was April earlier. That's because we read together in April. It was February. I swear this book came out in February. <laughs> it's okay. It's like, it's weird. It's a weird how the months have just marshmallowed. Uh, yeah, because our books came out the same month. That's so why I was like, well, she said April, but okay. Uh, <laughs> I think it didn't, it just didn't feel real until I got to read with you. So <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's softly sweet. Uh, I, I just want to thank you both. I really, um, this is a conversation I've been craving. It's a conversation we've been waiting for. And I just, again, want to thank the festival for creating this space and for hosting us today and turn it back to our session hosts.